have they changed eternity? We carry that ability. And I, my, my, in my, my thinkings, I'm thinking that we're learning that we live a lot, a lot further below our calling than we're used to, than we should. So let's just take a moment and just kind of bow our hearts and say, Lord, teach me to live in both realms. Teach us to live in eternity as we live in the natural. Lord, your word says that we, we're given a high calling. And that high calling is the fact that we can function in eternity as well as on earth. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to take us into those places. We thank you, Lord, that you're here. We thank you, Lord, you live in us for us, but you come upon us for others. Move, we pray, in Jesus' name. We're going to spend a couple minutes and we're going to worship. We know worship aligns us with the activity of heaven, and then we'll see where God takes us from there. Do you have anything, Pastor? Okay. Spirit, right now, Lord God, we fall upon every person in this place, Lord. We thank you for fresh wind and fresh fire. We thank you for your glory that's going to fall in this room tonight, Lord. Lord, we thank you, God, that you're going to speak to your people tonight in a powerful way, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would release your glory tonight, Lord. Lord, that we would that we would hear your voice, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us understanding, that you would bring revelation. I pray that, that the, rev the spirit of wisdom and revelation would come forth tonight in a powerful way, Lord. And I thank you, God, for what you are doing, for what you are going to do in our lives and thank you Lord and I praise you Father in Jesus name Amen and so um, I'm going to invite Michael to come up and to speak and so I want to um, say something about him first before him and, and many of you know that he's a pastor and founder of City Church and 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 well many of you have been his friend for for many years and know him very well. Um, but a lot of people don't know the, um, the deep prophetic gift that's within him. And, and so, so I remember, um, I remember when, uh, we, we did the, the school of the prophets, um, a, a, a couple of years ago here and he, he came and I put the blindfold prophet on him and, and and I I never saw a person prophesy so accurately over a person like he read their mail very very clearly and it was right on and so so this um this March he went with me to the Dominican Republic and so I I had I set them I set him up in a few churches to speak and one of the churches that he uh, he spoke at is a, a church now he's in relationship with in Dominican Republic, uh, um, commu uh, uh, community de of faith, Comunidad de Fe, uh, Pastor Victor Medina, um, they, he went there and he just prophesied over the whole leadership team and people there and people were just really amazed and, and, and they, first of all, that church really doesn't move too much in prophecy and and uh, and he just he just really nailed it very very strongly and so so I believe that a lot of times when you are young and developing in the ministry you don't even know what you are you know and sometimes um, I know that Joe Matero and so, uh, um, you know went through that at first he was a evangelist then he was a prophet then he was an apostle then he was a he was a teacher then he became a bishop no I'm only kidding but but all of all of the evolving that go um goes on 
in your in finding um, who you are in the in the body of Christ is just really just being open to the Spirit and just functioning and serving the church. And so as you as you develop in that, you you come into a you come into a realm where 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 you flow in you flow in giftings at times where you don't even know that you have it and you you flow in it. And sometimes the things that you don't want, God gives you, you know. And I would say Michael would say that he never wanted the prophetic and God gave it to him, you know. So, so it's, like, it's like you don't know what God wants to give you. And so what God wants you to have is an open heart and an open spirit to receive whatever he wants to give you and just to flow in God's anointing and God's spirit. And, and I just really believe that, um, that abounding love in city church, the, the Lord uh, is going to use them both to bless each other in a special way and, 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 to, and to bring each other's grace that, that where, where, uh, where one lacks the other, the other has the grace, and, and that's what, what the body of Christ is all about, you know? And so, so I, I, uh, I, a- I asked Michael to share tonight about, uh, about what does it mean uh, I, hear the, I hear the voice of the Lord saying, or how, how to hear the voice of God. So come up here, Michael, and go ahead. Well, hey, how are you? All right. Uh, before we jump into it, I'm, I've never done this. So I'm going to do a shameless plug for something, uh, but I will tie into what I'm talking about. So we have, a, we have a conference coming up in October, and so I've got some, some cards right here, and I want to invite you all. I want to invite you all to it, but what, what I'm most excited about this conference uh, is whenever it, it came out of 40 days of prayer and fasting that we did last year. And our, our church walked through Jonah, and uh, that kind of that led us to enter into a season of just 40 days of prayer and fasting. And whenever we started, I, I don't know if you, you guys probably understand, you try to book speakers sometimes, and it's like, this is who I want, and they're like, they're booked out for two years. And I'm just like, are you serious? And, and so we, uh, we kind of went through that and just did a lot of praying, but, but what what kind of morphed out of that was just really, really cool. And I just want to kind of share a testimony about it with you guys. Uh, we, have, we have Jonathan Tremaine Thomas, uh, who's with the International House of Prayer and is on staff at Destiny Church. He's coming, and he was, he was really the, the leader of uh, whenever all the protests broke out in Ferguson. He was the leader in the African-American and the black community to step in. And they set up a prayer tent right where all the protests were going on. And one night, right after the, the verdict came back that the officer was not going to get indicted on charges and all the riots broke out and the whole world was watching, him and his team were praying. And that night they saw over 200 people in the protest come to salvation. And so that's, he's also with, he also does some stuff with Awakening the Dawn, um, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. Um, Todd Cruz, Todd Cruz, uh, anyone ever heard of Hillsong? Hillsong, so Todd Cruz is the campus pastor for Hillsong and NYC. Uh, Todd Bishop is, uh, with the start of City Church, he was actually a confirmation. He didn't even realize it, Uh, and and I went and heard him preach somewhere, and as he was preaching, God was like, I'm telling you, Michael, I'm telling you, which we'll get to hearing the voice of God in just a minute. Uh, And so he's going to be there. Noah Herring, who is 23 years old, uh, this guy started with 12 kids, and 12 kids, 12 young adults, and was like, let's, let's just do a young adults ministry. And in one year, they grew to over 900 young adults. Uh, and then Eddie Tate, and Eddie Tate is from Bethel. Uh, and so let me, I want to kind of share this, this, this is a testimony. So uh, how many of you guys know Travis and Kristen Estes? You know, j- j- I'm not, I know. <laughs> you didn't raise your hand. So <laughs> this is Jim's daughter and son-in-law. Um, and they are, they are worship leaders. Uh, they are worship leaders for Bethel. 
uh, in Austin at their Austin campus. I don't know if you guys know this, but Bethel launched a campus about a year ago. Um, I have to empty my pockets because my jeans are so skinny. So, uh, but so I invited them. I was like, "Hey, it would be really rad if you guys came up and did worship." And the way Bethel works uh, is th- they have to run everything by their senior leadership team. And so it was, "Hey, we'd love to, but we need to we need to run it by." And so they then went to uh, their senior leadership team at their Austin campus. Their Austin campus then shot it up to Bethel Reading and their senior leadership team. They prayed about it and they said, "Hey." We want you guys to go, but not only that, we want to send a team with you guys. And they are Bethel Church is sending 14 people from Bethel Music, Bethel Worship, to this conference completely free of charge. Um, and so, and whenever I was talking to Eddie, and because Eddie's Eddie's on staff there, I was talking to him, and and I go, Eddie, why? And he goes, Michael, we prayed about it, and God gave us our marching orders. Outside of that, I don't know why. Um, so. This is all here for you guys, and the cool thing I love about it is you have people from the Reformed camp, the Pentecostal camp, the Charismatic camp, and they're all coming together to represent the body of Christ. And I'm really just excited about that and what God is going to do. I'm going to hand these to you guys, and y'all can, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, and stuff. So I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be in two places tonight. Before, here's kind of here's just kind of let you guys know. I'm going to be in Exodus 3 and John chapter 8. Um, My goal is to first deconstruct some stuff dealing with our identity that will then tie into us hearing from God. And so I believe every person here, I do believe God still speaks and God wants to speak to you. I, I, I am, I love prophets. I love prophecy. Uh, every time, you know, Jim this morning, he grabbed the microphone and was just psh, 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 with people at church today. I love that stuff, but y'all can also hear from God. Y'all can hear from God. And, and so I want to, I want to start in Exodus chapter three. Um, and I'm just going to read this passage and then we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Picking up in verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of Egypt, or bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, but I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. And when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall, you shall serve God on this mountain. And then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, they will ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, this is whenever Moses is tending to his flock and and he's doing what farmers or or shepherds would do, right? And and while he's tending to this, he he has this fiery bush moment, right? And he sees this bush on fire, which I think is just really awesome. And as he approaches the fire, we all know this. We've all seen, like, um, you know, the old school Ten Commandments movie, right, that they play every Passover season. We remember this. Uh, So we've seen it. But he sees this fiery bush, and whenever he sees this fiery bush, God's response is, stop, don't come any closer take off your shoes you're standing on holy ground and God starts talking to him through a burning bush now one of the things about fires is fires can be very inviting but at the same time very intimidating fires can be something that you especially in the winter time up here you want to gather around you want to be as close to the fire as long as it doesn't get out of control as long as it's a controlled fire right but then You've also seen houses burn down or wildfires that take place out in California or out in the Midwest, and people are fleeing for their lives. And so I I think it's interesting that God speaks to Moses through a burning bush. It's inviting, but at the same time, it's also intimidating because the, the fire of God should invite us, but it should also consume and destroy our sin in our lives. And, and so I want to I want to kind of I want to co- kind of do this right here. Moses said to God, "Who am I that I should go?" And I think that whenever it comes to hearing the voice of God, all of us, maybe not now, but at some point in our life, have been at a place where we've been like, "Who who is who am I, God? 
who am I, God? And we want to hear our Heavenly Father speak to us and say who we are. God, who, who am I right now? You don't understand the, the tension that I'm going through. You don't understand the problems that I'm facing. You don't understand the challenges that are, that are going on in my life. Are you even there? Are you paying attention, God? Who am I? And so God reveals himself to Moses through a fiery bush. And then right after that, Moses' response to God was, God, who am I? And I think that if we can just be transparent with each other, a lot of us, that's our question to God. And we want to hear what the Father says. There's, there's a few things that, that if you took I am, I am Michael Moore, right? I am Alex Travis, and it's good to see you. And, and so you and your beautiful face, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but you take the I am, we can insert so much stuff right there. We can insert, well, I am Michael Moore, and I am a Christian, and I am a father, and I'm a husband, and I'm a pastor, and I'm a drummer, and I'm someone who attempts to like fishing but really doesn't, and no, I do like fishing, right, but I'm just not the best at it. I am, uh, and I can add whatever adjective or noun to describe me and to, to place that identity on me. But I I think sometimes in our relationship with God, our walk with Christ, we have a tendency to not recognize some areas in our life that ultimately are keeping us from our true identity. And, And by that, let me just give you a few. I am a person who likes to be in control. I am a person who likes to be in control. And when I'm not in control, (laughs) and when I'm not in control of things, I love you, Marcy. And when I'm not in control of things, then I try to be more in control. It's, how, many, how many of you guys have ever been there? Marcy knows me. I, I, and God's been working on me. I have been a control freak. Like, I, you know, sometimes with our, our worship team, is it's like you have 19 minutes and 37 seconds, and at 19 minutes and 40 seconds, I'm walking up. Like, I'm, you think I'm joking. I have seriously been there. I have... I have been there. God set me free of that right now. So, uh, but I, I've totally been there where I am in control. But also, also in our lives, we we think about things that start to spin out of order. If I can just be transparent with you right now, I am less in control of my life now than I think I've ever been, and I have more responsibility now than I've ever had. And so there is this leaning and trusting into Jesus and crushing this ideology of me having to be in control of the circumstances or the situation in my life. The the other thing is, I am what I do. And just look, our, our American Western society has coupled everything about your identity with what you do. I am a firefighter, I am a teacher, I am a prophet, I am a, you, you know, a pastor, I am a uh, service worker, I am whatever it may, go talk to some people on the streets, just strike up a conversation with them, and within the first three to five minutes, so what do you do? And they're going to label and identify you based upon what you do, and I love it whenever people ask me, what do you do? especially whenever it's an Uber driver and they're blasting music and it's slang and cussing left and right. And, and so what do you do? I'm a pastor. Oh, radio gets turned down real quick. Like, so, you know, I, I, that, that happens to me all the time. Or you're on an airplane and you're sitting next to someone and they're just blabbing about everything and then it gets to the conversation. So what do you do? Well, I'm a pastor, like, oh, and then, and then it goes one of two ways, either one, you have a great conversation, or B, they open up the Sky Miles magazine, and they don't talk to you for the rest of the time, <laughs> which is, both of those has happened to me, both of those, we bless them in Jesus' name, right, but I, I am what I do, here's another one, I am what I own, I am what I, what I own, Uh, how often do we chase after materialistic things in order to give us some validity in our heart and to make us feel more secure about who we are? How often do we go into debt trying to keep up with the person down the street? How often do we just charge and charge and charge and collect stuff and stuff and stuff? I think about Air Jordans, right? Air Jordans, and and look, I don't own a pair of Air Jordans, but they, I mean, some of these shoes go for thousands of dollars. Look, I don't, I don't know how, how many of you guys are on social media, 
but you should go follow this, this one particular social media. Um, I guess it's a guy. He started it as a joke, but it's called Preachers in Sneakers. Have any of you guys heard of this? Preach, some of y'all? Some of y'all have heard Preachers and Sneakers. I mean, it's it's great. And I seriously, I think it's funny, but other people get really, really angry. Because, like, you see these pastors up there, and they take a close-up shot of their picture, and then they zoom in on the next frame, and then the next frame is how much it actually costs. And you have this pastor wearing a $5,000 pair of shoes. I'm not even joking. And I'm just like, this is funny, but this is also sad. Like, and so go, go check it out on Instagram. It's great. Um, and, and the guy started it as a joke, trying to be funny. And within like two weeks, he had over 100,000 followers. And so now it's kind of turned into his full-time job. Um, but how often do we associate our value and our identity based upon what we own? And, and look, and I don't know if you guys have ever dealt with this or you guys, but I know I've dealt with this. How often do I equate my identity and my success as a pastor to how large the church is? And if you've not been in ministry, once you step into ministry, you will see that that will creep up so quickly, so, so quickly. Here's the problem with all of that right there. All of that you're going to find will fail you in your life, will let you down, will deceive you and will stab you in the back and then you're left still being broken and not knowing who you are and for whatever reason we've created this mindset that life gets easier as time goes on right or we've created this mindset that life should just be easier i'm here to tell you it doesn't get any easier I love it whenever I'm talking with 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds, and we had a guy, and he just he just shipped off across the world, and 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 uh, he's at he's at Hillsong College right now, and it was just great having conversations with this guy, and y'all know who I'm talking about because he's man, doesn't it get any easier? Like, no, Jeremy, it does not get any easier at all. Life doesn't get any easier, but if your your identity is wrapped up into what may become easier in the future, you're ultimately going to end up getting lost. And so here, here Moses is. And Moses is having a conversation with God. And Moses says, who am I that you would send me to the people? Who, who, am, who am I? And God's response is very simple. I will be with you. I will be with you. So go tell the Israelites that you're about to set free from Egypt that I am sent you. That I am sent you. We cannot have a true understanding or revelation of hearing the voice of God if we do not know who we are in Christ. And if we battle with being in control and wrapping our identity in what we do and wrapping our identity in what we own and how successful we are or whatever it may be, we will find out that we bring that into our relationship with God and then we approach God for what we can get from God instead of giving, getting God himself. And this is, man, this is something that, that we have to, like we have to be able to check. We have to be able to understand this. We have to, it, so Tim, Tim Chester, he gives this really good explanation um, about this particular passage right here and relating it to Jesus Christ. And anyone know who Kate Middleton is? I think we all know who Kate Middleton is, right? Everyone watched her wedding and everyone's celebrating the birth of her child and um, all that stuff. So he, he talks about how Kate Middleton would go into um, he would, she would go, if, if she went up to Buckingham Palace or to go see the queen, right? Then at the age of 15, she would knock on the door, but not like you can actually knock at the queen's door, but let's just say you could, right? You know, walk up to the guards that don't move and, and Hey, I want to see the queen. I want to see the queen. And, and, uh, what are they going to tell her? No. 
But what if she added, I want to see the queen, and not only do I want to see the queen, I want to see the whole palace. I want to see all the closets, and I want to see the Tupperware, and I want to see the kitchenette, and I want to see the outside patio area, and I want to go swimming in your $75,000 in-ground pool or whatever. They would still say no. But now, if she goes up to Buckingham Palace and she says, I want to see the queen, they look at her, and she just says, I'm with him. And they open up the, the doors or the gates, and she can walk in, and she can go anywhere in the palace, and she can sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one with the queen. Kate Middleton, because of her relationship now with her husband, went from being a simple um, civilian to now being her royal highness, the Duchess of Cambridge. Why? Because she met him. The same thing is true in our relationship with Christ. Hear me out. The same thing is true in our relationship with Christ. We want to access our Heavenly Father. We want to know what He's thinking. We want to be able to understand what He's saying in this hour and in this time. And a lot of us are approaching God from a wrong perspective instead of realizing that whenever we are in Christ, right, we can go to our Heavenly Father and just say, I'm with Him. I'm with Him over here. I'm, I'm with Him. And what is God's response? Here you go. Here you go. I remember being in, at a youth camp, and uh, and and this this guy he was preaching, and he was a lot more you know entertaining than I am and stuff right now. And you guys aren't teenagers, so I don't have to be. Uh, I don't think y'all aren't teenagers, right? Like, okay, all right, good. I just want to I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure you can slap me later. So, uh, but like. I remember being in this, this youth camp, and the guy gets up, and he's like, I need someone to come up here. And he pulls the person up here, and he's like, all right, I have got a check that I have authorized from my board to write you for $100. You get to decide how much you want to write the check for. And, of course, it's a teenager, and so he doesn't want to take from the church because he would feel bad for the church, and then he didn't want to be perceived as greedy, but he knew that if he didn't put something in there that, you know, everyone's like, you had this opportunity to get $100. What are you doing? And, and so the, the kid ended up writing like 60 bucks, $60 or something like that, and then the guy grabbed the check. Let's just say this is the check, and he held it up, and he said, this is the problem with Christians is that we have 100% access to God, but we only take 60%. We have 100% access to our Heavenly Father. Who are you? Who are you? Jesus has this interesting dialogue in John chapter 8. People actually throw it at Jesus and they say, Hey, Jesus, are you demonically possessed? Which I just think is humorous. And, and, and this is, and essentially he says no, but picking up in chapter 8 verse 52, he says this. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets, yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. And so they're taking the teachings that Jesus was saying, and they're twisting it, and they're basically saying, hey, you're saying that you know Abraham, you're saying you know Moses, you know all this stuff, You've, you have to be demonically possessed. In verse 53, are you greater than our father Abraham, who died? I love that they threw that in there. Like, just in case you didn't know Jesus, he did die. He did, he's dead. And, are, and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? And this is Jesus' answer. He said, verse 54, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and he was glad. Verse 57. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham. And I love Jesus' response. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And so, man, here's the Jewish people right here, and God incarnated 
and deity embodied in a person is on this earth. And he reveals his glory. He reveals his identity right here. But because people were expecting something else or they wanted something else, they missed the fact that the Savior of the world, the Messiah, God himself was standing right in front of them. I am. Well, who are you? I am that I am. I am that I am. And so if Jesus right here is saying, I am, which is the exact same wording that was used in Exodus chapter 3 whenever Moses was talking to this burning bush. Who do I say that you are? I am. I am. That's it. I am supreme. I am superior. I am magnificent. I am God. I am deity. I am. So if Jesus is saying this, and Jesus is pointing us to our Heavenly Father, then my question for us then is who are you? Who are you? And this is what I love about the gospel is because we were dead in our trespasses, but because of the rich grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ and him laying down his life on that cross, we have now, Galatians 2.20, been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. Christ that has embodied us. So therefore, walk according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. Now, this sounds so elementary and so basic, right? But I really believe that this is at the root of understanding and hearing the heart of our Heavenly Father. This is at the root of hearing the voice of God. This is at the root of understanding. Because if we don't get this, then we're going to hear the voice of God with a warped mind. And our perception of it is going to be different than what God is actually trying to tell us. Your identity is not in what you do. Your identity is not in how successful you are. Your identity is not in how horrible of a person you are. Your identity, because of the cross of Jesus, is in Christ. And Christ, Christ died on that cross, and he absorbed our sins, he absorbed your sins and my sins, so that God can look at us through the lens of Christ and call us children. You know, I was talking to Travis, Jim's, Son, son-in-law, I almost said father-in-law. That would, that would be weird. That's not prophetic. So, like, but yeah. So, uh, uh, but I, I was talking to Travis, and he was talking to me about how the prophets of the Old Testament, um, he's, he's reading through the Bible in a year, and he was just, just really talking about, like, the prophets in the Old Testament and really how they see in part and they know in part, right? Paul ends up talking about this in Corinthians as well. We see in part and we know in part. But Jesus says... My sheep know my voice. Jesus said, I no longer consider you enemies. I consider you friends. It was accounted to Abraham righteousness because he was a friend of God. I I think then that our identity has to move to a place of I am his and he is mine. Our identity has to move to a place of I am a friend of God. Man, and hear me out. I love the whole Israel Holton song, like I am a friend of God, but like let that just sink in. This sovereign creator who breathes stars out of his mouth, who blinks and life happens, who speaks and mountains tremble, is your friend, is my friend. And there is nothing that can separate us from that. There is nothing that can separate us from that. I say all that to say this. Whenever I go hang out with a friend, I don't sit there and just complain the whole time. Whenever I go hang out with a friend, I don't just go, hey, Roy, gimme, 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 gimme. I commune with him or with her. I have a relationship with them. I want to know them. I want to know what they're going through. They want to know what I'm going through. We want to have intimacy. We want to be able to break bread. We want to, whatever it may be, the same thing is true with our Heavenly Father, and we have access to that because we're with Him. We're with Jesus, and we are His bride. John 15. I love John 15. Abide in the vine. 
Abide in the vine. That's what Jesus says over and over and over and over and over. Abide in the vine. I am the vine. You are the branch. Abide in me. Don't worry about fruit. Don't worry about stuff. Don't worry about the gifts. Don't worry. Just, just pursue me. Pursue me. And one of the things I'll say, and I'm about to get in some practical application, I think. One of the things I'll say, God is all about his glory. He's going to get glory in every situation. I just want it to be that he gets glory through my obedience and me being connected to him instead of the wrath of God being displayed on me. And I mean that for real. God will get glory from every situation in this world. God, let me be connected to your vine. A few practical. It's got to have the practical, right? A few practical things. Um, hearing the voice of God, I'm going to kind of give you three, three big points, and then I'm going to just share some stories of what this looks like for me, what I've walked through, and you guys get to uh, get to know me a little bit better. Number one, how do we hear the voice of God? We hear the voice of God through the Word of God, through the Scripture. If if you want to know what Jesus is thinking today about you, just open this book up and start reading. If you want to know the promises that are yours, the covenantal promises that are yours because we are children of God, we are co-heirs, catch this, co-heirs with Christ, according to Romans 8, man, crack this thing open and start meditating on the word of God. The Jewish rabbis would say that the word of God was honey to their lips, honey to their lips, because they were so ingrained and so, so in love with the written Word of God. You know what I love about this thing is every time I read the book of James, um, it's like James says, it's going to be a mirror in front of you, and God points something out. God draws me deeper and deeper every time. I can read the book of James every day for the rest of my life, and every day I can take a different lesson that God is trying to do in my heart to draw me closer to him. Same thing is true with numbers. I know we don't like to read numbers, or how about Leviticus? Like, oh, is that even a book, right? You know, like, skip that one. <laughs> Go, yes, cry, yes. You're, but like, and, and what you can do, and, and this, is, this is what I love, is like you can go to Leviticus, you can go to, go to Chronicles, you can go to Genesis, and you can find Jesus in all of that. Just like you can go to Revelation and you can find Jesus in all of that. But like truly reading this and just letting it absorb into your, and this is why, and everyone will tell you, I am, I, I am huge about the Word of God. I am huge, huge about, like, we have got to be rooted and grounded and build our life upon this foundation. Build our life upon this foundation. The other, the other thing is, uh, other way that you hear the voice of God is through others, which is, which is where you have prophets step in. Or, or you know, Jim is someone who is, a, he is a prophet. Like, he steps into his thing, and it's just, you know. I, I, was, I was hanging out with, with, well, hanging out. I had dinner with John Kelly, and he asked about you. And one of the things, one of the things he said was, uh, man, Jim is Jim, but whenever God gets on him, it's just, I'm like, yep, yep, I love you. But, but like, hearing the voice of God through others, and I'll give you some examples. Um, and, and this may be prophetic words that come to you. This could be dreams that someone has about you. This could be a word of knowledge or, or, or discernment that someone has about you. Maybe they're, they're praying for you, and while they're praying for you, something just pops in in their mind, and something just pops in. And, and I'm just going to share this story. Uh, it was a few years ago, and I, I think it was Joan Hunter. Is that, was she when, a few years ago whenever she was here? So... Then it was somebody else. I thought it was a Joan. Beverly. That was it. It was Beverly. Okay, so Beverly was here. <laughs> I was like, all right, so so Beverly was here. Beverly was here. And and this is, I mean, I was like, 
Hannah, right back where you're sitting over there, I was, I was, might have been in that exact same seat. So that's the hot seat tonight. Get ready, right? And so I, I was sitting back over there, and and I, I kid you not, and uh, and I came in here just being transparent with you. I came in here with a very cynical mind. I, I didn't want to be here. I was invited. I was here with Stephen Stewart, and Ryan Greenhall. I was like, all right, I guess I'll go. And and she's like, all right, everyone, just start praying in the spirit. And so everyone starts praying in the spirit, and I'm real stubborn, real stubborn. I'm just like, God, this is ridiculous. I don't want to be here right now. God, I just, you are, are you serious? And then she said, then she said it was Beverly. Not, yeah, it was. Then she said, um, pray for God to give you an image for the person next to you. And I go, do you remember this? And so I go, oh, uh-uh, we are not going there. We are not going there, God. And so I'm like, I, liter- I literally sat back there, and this is what I did. I'm not going to pray. <laughs> and I have Ryan Greenhall, and y'all that know Ryan Green. he was like, Shun, da, 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 da. I mean, he's just like, get, he's getting all into it. And Stephen's so sweet, he's just like, And I'm just, I'm just sitting here, I'm just like rocking, like this is, uh-uh, I'm not having this, I'm not having this at all. Um, I kid you not, and so everyone like get an image for the person next to you, I'm like, all right, God, you want to play this game? I'm going to think of an apple. I'm going to think of a big red New York apple, because that's the image I have in my mind. And I just, I, th- I think this whole thing is stupid right now. Like, I'm just apple. And so while everyone's praying and, you know, people are experiencing an encounter with God, I'm back there being stubborn, rocking, and I'm just like, apple, 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 apple. Android sucks. Android sucks. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so, so I'm, I'm back there, and I'm just like, apple, apple, apple. And I, I kid you not. I kid you not. She's like, all right, now everyone stop in the room. You know, she went, shh. Now turn to your neighbor and tell them the image that God just gave you for them. <laughs> Stephen Stewart, he turns to me and he goes, I just see a big red apple. And I'm like, shut up. <laughs> He's like, what? What? Maybe God's about to give you fruit or something. And I'm like, nope, nope. And God, this little small voice said, don't you dare challenge me like that again. And you want to talk about being, whoo, humbled? I was like, okay, okay. So God can use visions to other people to allow there to be a nice, swift, loving, fatherly rebuke to you. And that happened here. And I've shared that story with our church at least one time. And, and Stephen was, like, trying to interpret it. It was great. He's like, well, I think it's this. I'm like, no, I know exactly what it is. I just got slapped in the face by Jesus right now. <laughs> and, and so it was fun. But God, God used that moment to challenge me and ultimately to, like, open up my mind and open up my ears to hear what he was actually saying. And so going down to the DR, I saw some crazy stuff that I have never seen or I've seen in churches. But it's been since, like, Brownsville revival days in churches, all right? And, and, and I'm just like, everyone's like, what do you make of this? And it's like, I don't know what to make of this. I don't know what's God and what's not God. I can't deny that that little boy's feet, though, that didn't have an arm, psh, was healed on stage. I can't deny the fact that this woman who was came up here for prayer started, you know, vomiting all over the place and 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 then walked up completely different. I I can't deny what God's doing. And I don't understand it all. And so this is where the word of God comes back in because you can take your experiences, you can take the things that you can see and you can filter them through the word of God. And what I love about God is God has placed limitations on himself and it's called the word of God. And and by that I mean he's not going to contradict his word. And so, so if you get a prophetic word and the prophetic word is you are to hide in a cave and not do anything for the rest of your life and, and you're supposed to be there and chant and hit your head in the head like they do in Monty Python because that is the will of the Lord on your life. If that's the word of God that you get, then you run that through the lens of the scripture and oh, let's see Matthew 28, 19, where he says, go make disciples of all nations. I think that that contradicts us hiding in caves, hitting ourselves with, with stone. 
And, and so you can take these words that God gives you or that people give you and filter them through the word of God. And that's where I, I, mean, I love the scripture and, and other people, prophecy, all of that. It, man, God wants to affirm and confirm through other people and sometimes offer a swift, lovingly rebuke. And I just want to say this. If God is correcting you, man, know that God is still working in your life. If you're going through a tough season and God is just, man, he is just chastisement and this is going on and, and it's just like, God, what is going on? Man, know that he's trying to get something through your head. He's trying to get something through your head and into your heart so that he can transform the character that's in here so that you can do the things that God ultimately has destined for you to do. And then the other thing, and, and this, is, this is something that I'm still learning and I'm not the best at, I'll be honest with you, is prayer. Prayer is another way to hear the voice of the Lord. Because whenever you get into an atmosphere or into a season of prayer and you start fleshing these things out, and, and look, I'm not talking about God, thank you for the food and bless the missionaries in Jesus' name, amen, let's eat. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about getting alone with God. And for me, I crank up some, some music. I, I usually listen to instrumental music and, and I'll sit there with my Bible and I just start praying. And I'm not, I'm not talking about like, like, you know, calling down heaven and, and shaking and stuff. I'm, I'm just talking about I'm sitting there at my desk at 11 o'clock at night. God, it's been a, it's been a rough day. God, it's, it's been a rough day. And um, I feel like I failed today as a father. I got really angry with Judah. And, uh, and I just start talking to him. And then that shifts somehow into worship and adoration and praise. And somewhere in the middle of all that, you know, Jesus said this in John 14, peace I give you, peace I leave with you. And so whenever God, even whenever it's a season of correction, and you're praying and you're seeking him, there's a peace that will come upon you. And, and your circumstances, and I'll get to, I'm about to give you some examples, your circumstances will get all crazy, and you just got this peace inside. You've got this, okay, God, this is good. That's God talking to you. That's got that peace that you feel. That's God talking to you. It may not be like, Michael, do this, but it's. I just want to make sure y'all are awake. That's all. I, I want to kind of give you some examples. Just some, uh, they're not even practical. This is just what I've walked through. I've already shared one being here, but let me let me just give you this one. Uh, I was engaged to this girl by the name of Heather. We won't go into all the details. The relationship ended. It was not a. She didn't sin. I didn't sin. It was nothing like that. We just, it just wasn't meant by God. And, and well, now I have to go into the details. Uh, so I, I started attending this church. And whenever I'm attending this church, um, I decide to join the worship team. And we have a worship night. And, you know, I'm a drummer. And I get all into it and stuff. And, and there's like eight people at this worship night. It's, I mean, it's like, we're going hard, and no one else was there, so it was kind of cool. Uh, and, and so there was this girl on guitar, and uh, again, I'm engaged to somebody else, and so I wasn't, like, looking or attracted or anything like that. My, you know, I'm getting married in seven months, and, you know, this is what my focus is right now. Well, two, three months later goes by, uh, and I, I go up. Uh, I'm sitting there talking to the pastor of this church, and, and the girl comes up to me, and she goes, I'm Christy. I just want to introduce myself. And if, honey, if you're watching right now, I love you. I love you. And, and uh, this, is, this is what happened. You're going to spend the rest of your life with that girl. I heard that voice in my head. And I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And then a few months go by, and Heather and I, we were leaving church. And I kid you not, we get, in, we get into my truck. We're driving back. And she goes, you know, Michael, if by some odd chance we don't end up getting married, I want you to know I'm totally okay with you dating Christy. And I was like, well, that's just random. Like, oh, you don't have to worry about that. Well, sure enough, six weeks before the wedding, I was in New York City. And um, not to get too personal, but I was taking a shower. God was speaking. He was cleansing me, right? I was getting baptized that morning. Um, and while I was in the shower, I'm just sitting there, and I hear this small voice and it wasn't, Michael, she isn't the one for you. It was, Michael, you're not the one for her. And I go, okay. And I went back, and I walked into her apartment, 
and I climbed up the stairs. She lived on the second floor, and I walked in that room, and I just started weeping, and she knew, and I knew, and it wasn't that there was anything wrong. Now, fast forward a little bit. Christy was praying for her future husband, this dude, and it wasn't like she was like, Jesus, destroy that relationship so I can, you know, it wasn't like that at all. I want to make that very, very clear. But she, I guess she thought I was cute or something. Um, I'll take it, right? And, and, uh, and after that, after, after that, she found out that I was engaged. And so she was just like, all right, whatever. And so she just started, God, I thank you that you have a husband for me, that he's going to love the Lord and that he knows how to pray and, and all this stuff. Um, well, jump jump forward a little little bit later. We went on our first date, and I told her we were at Ralph's Tavern, which has great uh, fettuccine Alfredo. Just throwing that out there. I was sitting there at Ralph's Tavern, and I told her, hey, I'm going to marry you. And she goes, I know. God's already told me. And then, and then we started talking. I kid you not, first date, first real date. The, the pre-date was at Pizza Hut, but that's irrelevant. First real date where we dressed all nice. We started talking about the names of our kid, and we both had that our firstborn male was going to be named Judah Benjamin. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And my firstborn male is a, he is, well, my firstborn, his name is Judah Benjamin. And so um, that's an example of God speaking. And whenever he spoke and I shook her hand and he said, you're going to spend the rest of your life with this girl, I didn't realize that that was even God until like nine months later. And sometimes God speaks to you, and it seems so absurd. It seems so weird. God, there's no way that you would be speaking, speaking to me now. Maybe it isn't for that immediate season. Maybe it's for a season to come that he's just preparing you for. A, a, another example of starting the church, and this is kind of confirmation through other people, is I was in Times Square. I went to Times Square Church, David Wilkerson's church, and I was there on a Friday night. And, and for some young adults thing, I literally just happened to stumble in on it. And uh, they had a guest speaker, and so they had it broken up into two sessions. It was like a 7 o'clock session and an 8.30 or something. And uh, in the middle of the session, they had a 15-minute intermission. And so I was like, I'm going to run to the restroom. Uh, well, let me, let me back up. So in worship during the first session, God spoke to me and said, I want you to start a church like a nightclub. I think that's what I heard. And I was like, what? On, like, this is weird. Well, I go to the restroom. I get back from the restroom. I'm checking my email. And many of you guys have heard this story. But I get an email from a local pastor that said, hey, this is going to sound weird. My wife and I were praying. And if you ever decided to do a work in Albany, we want to help you get going. I was like, okay, that's cool. Well, that night, we drove back up to Albany. We had a prophetic uh, encounter, a prophetic meeting, something like that. I don't remember what they called it at the church. And it was just word after word after word after word that was spoken over. The spear of evangelism over the city of Albany and ministry in the, the city of Albany. This is what God's tr- And I was just like, okay. And then that night, I ended up going to a church, and, and they had a guest speaker who was Todd Bishop. And he got up, and he talked about how God was beckoning his heart to go plant this church in Long Island and how he ended up doing that and his obedience and how there's people in the room who that's God is speaking to you. And I'm sitting there in the room and I'm like, okay, I think that you're getting my attention. And then the, the, the nail in the coffin for me that I knew God was talking was the very next Sunday, there, that Sunday morning, I ended up going into church um, and, and this woman named Patty Coyle, and she is, and I, I see y'all laughing, y'all know, I mean, she's redheaded Italian lady. She comes up to me, and she goes, Pastor Mike, I had a dream last night, and you were on Pearl Street at the bars calling them use out of them bars. And I was like, all right, God, you got my attention. You got my attention. And so that started the journey of what was White Couch that later became City Church. And you know what's crazy about that is the very first thing God spoke to me, it says you would start a church like a nightclub, in a nightclub, whatever it was, uh, we tried going to all these different venues. The only place that would have us, a bunch of 20-something um, messed up people who just love Jesus, the only place that opened their doors to us was a nightclub. was a nightclub. It took a little while for what he said to come to pass, but he spoke it. And whenever he speaks it, his promises are yes and amen. I'll give you, I'll give you another example. Uh, 
we I have two more, two, three more, three more examples. I'll go a lot quicker. I promise. Uh, Christy and I, we were we were praying. This is this is confirmation, okay? Uh, Christy and I, we were praying. We got a job offer down in Cave City, Kentucky. Yep, you haven't heard of it. Don't worry. Um, Cave City, Kentucky, and we go down there, and uh, this church is, you know, eight or 900 people, and they've got two campuses. The bathrooms were so clean that you could eat a fine dinner off of their floor. Like, I mean, you know, like they, I was like, oh, my gosh, this place is balling. This is nice. They got video cameras, and they've got, it was really, really nice. Uh, and so they were they were interviewing us. Meanwhile, we're struggling at City Church, and I'm like, I, God, I don't know what's going on. We got like 12 people, or at least it seemed that way, like, Jesus, help us, and, and uh, we're driving back, and we're going through Cleveland or Cincinnati, whatever that Ohio city is in the southern part, and, and as we're going through it, uh, the, the pastor called, um, and he's like, hey, so what'd you think? I talked to the board. They really liked you, blah, blah, blah. They're probably going to make you an offer, all this stuff, and I was like, oh, yeah, it was great, and oh, yeah, I met her too, and yeah, that was the one you warned us about, yep, you know, all of that, and, and so, you know, every church has one or two of those, right, and, uh, and so chatting, I'm joking, I'm joking. So chatting, and, uh, and we get off the phone, and I, I look to Christy, and I go, Christy, what do you think? And she turned to me, turned to me, and she goes, nope. And I go, yeah, you're right. You're right. God used my wife to be the confirmation of what I felt. We got back to our church, and our church literally grew by 40 people in like two weeks. And, and then it was like three weeks later, I was just like, God, everything that we've been praying for for the past four years is finally starting to happen. Michael, don't you dare doubt me. Don't you dare doubt me. Uh, uh, another one. Oh, I already shared this one, actually. Revo Conference came out of 40 days of prayer and, prayer and fasting, and then how everything has lined up for it. Just, just blow me away. But, but here's, I'll, I'll close with this. I'll close with this. Because this is this is recent, and and many many of you guys, some of you guys will know this. Um, we've had we've had a hard, hard year as a family, a hard year. And uh, my uh, my wife gave birth to Allison, and you guys that are parents, you understand going from one to two, it changes the dynamic in the household. And so there's, I'm learning how to change diapers all over again, and I'm being vomited on all over again, and sleepless nights are back, praise be, right? And, and, and so kind of just going through all of that, uh, and then it was right around Thanksgiving time we found out that Christy's father got, uh, I, I was actually in the hospital with him whenever they came in. He went into the ER, and he said, we found cancer. We think it's lung cancer. We got to do some biopsies and stuff. And it was about seven weeks after that, maybe eight weeks, they just put a port in for him to do chemotherapy. And on a Friday, he went into the hospital, and a few days later, he passed away. That was a trigger of multiple things not going the way I planned and my wife planned for them to go. Because what happened was our house was broken our uh, struggles were real. And then on top of that, we got hit with bill after bill after bill after bill unexpectedly. Look, we, we bought a new car a few years ago. I've dumped so much money into that stupid car this year. And it's just like, like I'm on the DR trip and, and the alternator just goes out. Like it's only two years old, God. It's only, and the alternator goes out, maybe it was three years old. And, and so wrestling with this and... Then on top of that, our church, we moved from the old bank into the, the Washington Armory, which sounds great. Sounds great. Woo, we got this big venue, except for, well, the first uh, three weeks, it's going to be set up and tear down every week. And it, it ain't a small thing to, to set up and tear down. It's, it's massive. And, oh, oh, Easter Sunday was great. That's great. Next week, though, we have an event. We didn't tell you guys about it. I'm so sorry. Oh, and then the week after Mother's Day, we have another event, so you got to find somewhere else to have church. It's like, all right, well, this is, this is frustrating. So then things start going up and down with the church. Things are going up and down at my home. Um, it, it's just getting shaky, and it's hard. 
I'm, I'm broken and hurting on the inside. And I remember sitting there, and, and literally, like, there's, there's, you know, we had the Waltersdorfs, who today was their last day, and they're leaving. We have Ryan and Jen Greenhall, who are leaving our church in 2020 to go plant a church in Mechanicville. Praise God. But it's like, okay, God, what about this? We have building issues. Um, we're, Christy and I are struggling financially. Uh, my wife and my family is grieving the loss of a godly godly man and and walking through this and 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 just the emotions high and low and high and low and high and low high and low and I get on the phone with someone and I start talking to them um and as I'm talking to him uh, we talk for an hour and a half and and I'm I'm look this is going back to the friendship I'm just this is good this is bad this is hell on earth I don't know what's going on right now um and he says something the last 10 seconds hey Michael I got to go to bed, but I just want you to know God's never let you down in the past, and he won't let you down now. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, the peace of God, the peace of God fell at 1230 in the morning in my living room. And I got off the phone with him, and I broke down weeping. I broke down weeping in my room in the living room, and it was literally like the presence of God just came in, and he said, hey, Michael, it is the kindness of me that leads us to repentance. It's the kindness of me that's allowing you to go through this, and so I'm not saying that life is going to get better. If anything, life as a follower of Jesus gets harder. Hearing the voice of God is going to challenge you. Hearing the voice of God means that there's opposition on the way. Praise God. Hallelujah, right? T.D. Jake says, new level, new devils. Come on, somebody. I can't do it the way he does it. Get ready, get ready, get ready, right? New. It is. It is. But, but here's what I'll say. You may experience new levels and new devils. You may experience anxiety. You may experience fear. You may experience suffering. All of that stuff may end up happening, but you know what the promise of our Heavenly Father is? I am will not leave you. I am will not leave you. And so I don't, I don't know where you are tonight. I don't know what's going on in here. But God speaks, and he wants to speak. And he may do that through his word. He may do that through other people and confirmations. He may do that through prayer. He may do that through random people coming up to you saying, I see a picture of an apple. But he's still speaking. And he's with you. He's with you. That's all I got.